Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar on audio challenges in eSports presented by Cameron O'Neill. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. Um, I wanted to go over a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a chat function where you can submit questions to the presenters and they will try to answer as many questions as possible. This webinar will be recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. And we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop Series. And you can find that on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman, Harman Professional University to see our many on-demand and certification courses. And all of those are available to you for free. And now I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Cameron O'Neill, the presenter for tonight's webinar. Cameron is a 20-year veteran of the event industry, having worked at the Sydney Opera House and for Rydell throughout Asia. Recently, he has helped many esports companies in China build their AV systems, including major events, installed facilities, and network audio systems. And now I'll pass the mic over to you, Cameron. Cool. Thank you, Laura, for the introduction, and uh, welcome, everyone, to this presentation on uh, AV challenges in esports. Uh, I'll do my best. I know this is a web conference and I guess a lot of you are also working from home. I am working from home, so uh, my apologies in advance if we have any external interruptions from the children or from uh, poor web connection. If that's the case, someone I'm sure will let me know. Okay, so eSports, it's one of the fastest growing areas in live production um, in the world right now. Uh, and that was even before the COVID crisis has forced everyone to avoid large gatherings, so like sporting uh, events. Um, and I think because of that, we're gonna see a lot more em emphasis put on eSports. So today what I'm gonna look at is I'm gonna start with looking at the basics of an eSport production, which is pretty much generic across whichever sport you're gonna play. Um, then I'm gonna have a quick look at where the money's coming from. And I do that just because I find that if you follow where the money's coming from in these events, it gives you a good idea of what's actually important to the longevity of the event. And then we'll have a look at the different categories of esports uh, and how they break down and, and the unique challenges to each of those. Um, and then we'll look at some of the ways that the, the esports companies and the production companies uh, that are actually working on this now uh, are actually getting over these challenges. Cool. So here is our first issue, PowerPoint, haha, <laughs> it was being slow. Cool, so eSports is relatively new. Uh, it's only, in some senses, it's been around for probably 10 to 15 years, but in terms of the uh, top level, live level event that's on, you know, on par with other sports things, it's only been around for a few years. Um, and the newness of that genre has kind of come up with a whole bunch of challenges that until now were never really uh, apparent. Uh, pretty much all these games were designed to be played in your own home. You, know, you set up a, a system that's designed for you in your space, uh, relevant to your space, uh, and you don't have to worry about anything else that's going on around you. You know, you'd connect to players via the internet, uh, you'd control everything that's in your room. Uh, and if any of you have been to an electronics shop recently, uh, you might have noticed that there's these big areas with uh, flashing keyboards and chairs the size of your house, uh, different kinds of headphones and headsets that are all designed to, you know, with their own claims at how they're going to make you better at your game. Um, and the strange thing is that some of these things are actually right. Um, the life of esports is measured in milliseconds. Uh, and you'll find things like people will not use wireless mice, keyboards or headsets because the millisecond latency just between your input lag there uh, is too much for these people. And at a competitive level, it definitely makes a difference. Uh, but just like there's a difference between playing, you know, soccer or playing catch in your backyard and then moving to the big leagues, there's a significant difference between playing in your home and playing uh, on a stage. So let's, uh, let's have a look at uh, what a modern event looks like today. So the first thing with any sports event, the most important thing, of course, is competitors. You, know, you need to have a team A and a team B, or maybe you play your A, play a B, or in some cases, many more than that. Um, this is what it would look like if you're on the internet playing against each other, but that's not really that interesting. So similar to old sports, we need a stage, we need a stadium, we need a field, we need something uh, where we can put those two teams together in the same space. And then, just like any other, you know, uh, professional sports team, there's a there's a support team. There's 
backup players, there's coaches, there's you know family and friends who want to see that that obviously aren't going to be on stage. They need to be in the backstage area. And as with any other legitimate sport, there's rules that have to be followed. So there's judges that have to enforce those rules. Um, those judges can be simple people watching the game to people who are actually checking the code and making sure that no one has brought anything in from the outside to alter the ability of the game. Yeah, so legitimacy is probably the biggest key challenge uh, in esports. And if you think about it, it's the same with any other sport. Um, we see the Olympics has a huge anti-doping um, uh, section that they will test every medal winner before they actually receive their medals. Uh, Any time that there's a sports cheat or a, uh, for example, in the cricket, you know, people using sandpaper on, on the cricket ball, most of us wouldn't even notice that, but it turns into a huge scandal. So the judges are there. Legitimacy is a, is a key point of esports. These, these areas here is what I, I like to call the, the sports group. This is the sports team, basically, that, that runs the event. And that's similar to anything else. If you go to the Formula One, for example, um, you'll definitely see that there's a, there's a <laughs> distinct boundary between the motorsports part of the Formula One and then the media part, the broadcasting part that goes elsewhere. The next group, of course, if you want to have a live event, and all of us have done live events, you know, you need to have an audience. If there's no one at the event, then it's not a live event, it's just a recorded event in the studio. Uh, but if you have an audience, the audience needs to see what's going on, they need to hear what's going on, so we need screen and speakers, which is pretty obvious. And to run the screen and speakers, as you know, I'm assuming a few of us have done before, you know, you need a front of house position. You need to have technical people who actually run that equipment, run the screen, choose what's going to go on the screen and everything else as well. Uh, now, unlike sports in the general sort of sense, if I go to a soccer game or a baseball game, I can use my own eyes and I can see what's going on on the field. Uh, but with esports, everyone's looking at their own computer and there's not really much to see on screen, uh, on the, um, excuse me, on the stage. So you need to have an announcer to explain what's going on, uh, especially when we start getting into the faster paced games, which we'll look at momentarily. In fact, the announcers uh, are called shoutcasters in most esports uh, because these guys are super high tension. They've got a high pace event that's going on and they're generally screaming. Uh, the level of noise that you get in the audience at an esports event is, is uh, undescribable, I think. <laughs> okay. So the last group here I've got here, I've put broadcast slash streaming. Um, in general, it should actually be the other way around. Streaming is a much bigger part of the esports world than the broadcasting is. Uh, and generally it's managed in house. Um, if you think about most traditional sports, you'd have an OB team that would roll up next to the stadium or the, uh, the arena, would plug in all their equipment, they would create the broadcast and then they'd disappear. As I mentioned before with the, the Formula One, it's a different world. Um, but because a lot of these esports have come from that online streaming world, they're used to making their own production themselves. Uh, and we'll see in a moment why the streaming is such a big part of this. So three different groups, fairly analogous to what you'd see at a normal traditional sports event. Um, but the way things are done there and the way that these audiences and technologies have actually evolved is actually completely different. So you end up with a very unique production and you'll find that there's a lot of things that you would not have actually anticipated if you've come from uh, say soccer broadcasting or uh, baseball broadcasting and then going into esports and vice versa. These people who have come from the gaming world and online world and now getting into the broadcasting world and are finding a whole bunch of challenges that they had never contemplated either. So it's, a, it's an incredibly unique production. And just to give you an idea of the scales uh, here, this is the 2018 League of Legends final. Um, it's one of the reference points that people use when they talk about the scale of esports. Um, the bird's nest in China, if you don't know, was the 2008 Olympic Stadium. Uh, it was used for the opening closing ceremonies and also for the athletics. Uh, and this is the League of Legends final in that event in uh, 2018. And it was at full capacity. They sold all 80,000 seats. Uh, and then online, there was 99 million people watching on the stream and on the broadcast, which uh, as far as I can tell is about the same as the Super Bowl. So 
I hear a lot of people thinking that esports is contained to these small events or exhibition events that are on the side uh, of a major sporting events, but in their own right, uh, these events are at that same level as anything else. So let's get to the basic question, what's esports? Um, they're basically competitive video games. You need to have multiple people playing against each other. You know, a lot of us have played some kind of video game at some point, and there's a lot of these solo games, but obviously we need to have a competition uh, if you want to be able to turn it into an actual sport. One thing that's becoming interesting and, and just on its own is a challenge um, is that most of us, if you're in Pro AV and you've done Event AV, you're used to connecting a computer uh, or doing what we're doing now, you know, doing a web conference where people can see a computer screen. Uh, that gets harder when you talk about consoles and you know, borders on impossible when we talk about mobile. Uh, but a vast majority of the games, something like 80% of new games are coming out for mobile. Uh, and as we look down at the MOBAs, the, uh, the online battle arenas, almost all of these have played exclusively on mobile. And yet these are the ones that are popular with the audience there, you know, and we'll see in a moment why that's important. Um, but incredibly challenging uh, if you're trying to actually make some content off that. You know, I don't know how many of you have tried to connect someone's mobile phone to a projector <laughs> at an event, but I know I have, and I know it's not easy. Okay. Um, the industry itself is also worth more than a billion dollars now, which, you know, if we compare to other sports is, still small, but it's growing at such a rate um, that it's, it can't be ignored anymore. So if we look at the revenue, this is the worldwide revenue in, in millions over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, in 2012, we're talking about 130 million, which is not much, but that has doubled every two to three years now. Um, and it doesn't show any signs of slowing. So you can see here that uh, in 2018, uh, it was 865. In 2019, last year, it passed a billion. Um, in revenue, and we're going to hit you know, close to two billion by 2022. Uh, and this graph was actually from last year, before the year had finished, and that was before things like COVID-19 came up and, and put a lot more attention onto the esports uh, world. You know, we can't have big events, which makes some of those major sporting events um, problematic, and yet esports is still starting to thrive in a in a slightly different way. The competitions are huge and they're bringing in pretty massive audiences at the same time that uh, sports audiences are dropping. Um, I won't go into figures, but we can see a steady decline in things like the Super Bowl ratings and the uh, Olympics ratings. If we look at pure numbers of people watching, um, as the, there's a democratization of sports that you can actually watch online. And now that we have the Asian Games that are accepting esports uh, as, a, as an Asian Games sport and the Olympics are considering it, that's only raising the profile. So there's, this graph might actually be underestimating the growth that we're going to see in the next few years um, from esports. And definitely there's not many other events that you're seeing this kind of growth. So where's that money come from? Well, like a lot of sports, you know, sponsorship is important. Sponsorship here is making up the, you know, a good third of the entire revenue that's coming to, uh, to esports, and then media rights on top of that is uh, about another quarter again. Um, those are the two traditional sources of income for pretty much any sport. Uh, if you look at you, know, the, you look at FIFA, you look at the Olympics, you look at uh, Formula One. It's all basically coming from the sponsorship directly from brands to the teams or the athletes, and then the media rights of the broadcasters who want to make their own advertising revenue off those events. The other three, though, are a bit unique. Uh, streaming advertising is where, instead of using a broadcaster as a middleman to basically make that advertising revenue, you become a broadcaster yourself. Uh, you use a platform like Twitch um, that would uh, let you broadcast directly to your fans, and then the advertising revenue comes directly to you with a small split going to Twitch, rather than the, advertise, the broadcaster paying you and then the advertisers, advertisers paying the broadcasters. And you can see that that's almost on par. And I would actually suspect that in the next few years, that's probably going to get bigger than the media rights themselves, which in a, in a different sense is a challenge of where the revenue is coming from, because if broadcasters aren't making money, uh, but the companies themselves are making money, then that's a pretty big, important step. Uh, consumer ticket sales. Uh, 
is a bigger portion than what you'd see in other sports. I mean, obviously you can still play to go to a stadium and watch your team play, uh, but the live event part of um, leagues like the League of Legends um, run by Riot Games, the live experience is a much bigger part of that community building that they're trying to do. Um, and you'll actually see people who've never played the game at all still have a favorite team and they'll actually go and uh, root, for their, root for their team in their venues. Um, to the point where some leagues in China have actually built up uh, something like 17 local stadia across the country so that you're always near uh, somewhere we can actually go and watch the event. And the last little wedge there is, um, is also quite important as well. This is the customer contribution, uh, sorry, consumer contribution. This is where someone who is watching your stream, so if I'm sitting in my home watching my team play, I can directly donate to that team or to that league. So there's no advertising, there's no broadcaster involved, it's just me giving money to someone who I like to watch playing. Um, and you can see there, it's, it's also pretty big. That's $129 million um, of direct contribution, which doesn't have the middleman of a broadcaster, it doesn't have the middleman of a platform, it's just me giving money to a, to a player. That is basically pure profit. So whilst we're looking at the revenue here, if you actually look at the profitability, the, constant, uh, the customer const contribution is the most important part of what these guys are doing. So what does this mean? As I said before, what does this actually mean then for the event itself? Well, you wanna have events that people wanna watch and you want ones that people are gonna get excited about and they're gonna actually sit there and do those uh, contributions or you know, watch the streaming advertising, less so than the media rights. Um, and in fact, I would suspect that the media rights and sponsorship are mostly geared towards uh, what we call the exhibition events, which I'll get to in a moment. You know, the flip side to this, of course, is the legitimacy. And as I mentioned before, this is the, the crux uh, of all the challenges that we see in esports. No one wants to watch a rigged game uh, to a certain degree. I, I liken it sometimes to the difference between FIFA and WWE. You know, both uh, big entertainment properties. You know, we should <laughs> make no doubt about that. Uh, but the difference is that before the last goal was kicked in FIFA, you don't know who's going to win the World Cup. Um, whereas in WWE, someone at least knows who's going to win each championship. Uh, and esports is in that divide right now. It could become a fully scripted entertainment property, or it could become a legitimate sport. Uh, and the majority of the, the effort these days and the challenges that are coming from that are trying to push it towards that sports legitimacy. Because yeah, we all want to have games that we want to watch and no one wants to watch a cheater. Okay, so I'll stop boring you with business and statistics and numbers and let's start talking some actual technical things. Um, Esports uh, are basically fit into one of the four categories that you see here, and I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail here. Uh, but basically, this is in order of the technical difficulty, uh, which I guess is what a lot of you are interested in here. Uh, at the top, you have what I call the simulation games. Uh, these are things that are simulating something real, uh, like a soccer game or a, a martial arts match. Then after that, we have a first-person shooter, um, which is uh, all the first-person games, they're usually shooters, um, where you're looking through the views of someone, uh, a character's eyes directly. Um, Top-down or RTS games, these are the ones where you're looking from a high angle. And then the, the newest category here, which is also the most difficult, which is the MOBAs, the multi-massive online battle arenas or uh, battle royales. So sports simulators are copying a real or a real-ish sport. Um, so I, I lump games like Capcom and Street Fighter in here uh, because they have the same technical uh, level of difficulty. So you usually have two teams or two players uh, playing against each other. Um, and one key factor, as you can see on the background here, is that anyone watching can see basically everything that's going on uh, in the game. So if you're, you know, think about the simplest Street Fighter example, you have two people fighting each other, you can both see what the other guy's doing at all times. Uh, or here with FIFA 19, you can see where every person is on the, uh, on the ground, you can see where the ball is, and you can see where they're moving. So it doesn't really matter if you place the screen um, behind the players or in front of the players, uh, the shoutcasters can be as loud and as uh, active as they want, and the audience, similar to an audience in a, in a stadium, um, 
I don't quite sure what's going on. I'm going to improve that. <laughs> Someone wants to annotate. I'm not quite sure what's going on here. I'm going to close that there. Okay. Sorry. Apologies for that. Um, okay. So in the sports simulator, um, yeah, so everyone can see it. And there's like a, a going to a stadium to watch a team. It's very encouraged for you to actually call out to your team. You know, if you're someone kicks a great goal, every you want the crowd to cheer for that. You know, if someone makes a great pass uh, or hits a home run, you want to feel that that engagement between the audience and the players. So you have this fairly typical sports environment, and everyone, I think, from the from the esports side and from the broadcast side, is is used to making this event go on. Um, the problem, though, is that it's not really great gameplay or great sports. Um, and you'll see I put that there, you know, it's an attempt to balance the realism of the gameplay. Um, a great example of this is the Formula One. They haven't been able to race recently, so they've been running a virtual Formula One series. And during that series, you're finding that the actual Formula One drivers are not as good as uh, people who are the esports drivers there. So. It's obviously not as realistic as it would be as a sport, um, but because you're trying to make it realistic, the gameplay isn't as, let's say, natural or fun to watch as a game that's designed to be a game from the ground up. So, you know, in terms of making a long-term fan base, you're not really going to get it here with the sports simulators. You'll find that uh, if you go and have a look at any of the sports simulators, Okay, more messages. Hopefully you can still hear me. If not, I'm sure someone will let me know. Um, yeah, so you will, uh, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, yeah, you won't, you'll, if you go to a, a computer store or a game store, you'll see that there's, um, there's a 2018 and a 2019 and 2020 or a 2021 version of Formula One, of FIFA, of every other sport that's, uh, that's out there. Um, but, because of that, you're not going to get one scene that says, hey, you know what, I really love FIFA 19, let's stick with that. So let's move on to the next category here. Oh, sorry, let's, uh, let's have a quick look at the event uh, based on that uh, anatomy that we saw before. So we have the same layout. We have the two teams on stage. We have their, back, uh, their backyard support team. Uh, we have the audience and we have the front of house. So we don't really have to concern ourselves here. This is what a lot of people think of when they think uh, an esports event. They see the team, they see the screens, they see the speakers. This is fairly typical. There's nothing that we really have to worry ourselves about. Next up is the first person shooters. Um, the first person part is, is quite obvious. So you're looking through the first person view of the character that you're playing. Uh, but of course, each then player in the game has their own individual view. Uh, they are incredibly high speed. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is where the millisecond timing comes up. You'll find that people will show how many frames they're playing per second, and we're talking a few hundred frames. Uh, and people will complain about 10 milliseconds worth of lag uh, from their wireless mouse versus a wired mouse. But a key point here is that because you have your own point of view of the map, you can't see everything that's going on. And part of the the challenge here is to actually sneak around the map and try and get behind the other team so you can attack them before they even see you. Um, also, that means that communication between the players becomes a lot more critical. Uh, if you're playing a soccer game or a baseball game, you can basically yell out to each other and everyone can see what's going on. But here, you have to explain what you're seeing to your teammates so that they know um, that they should come and help you or that there's another place that's clear. Also, the game gives audio cues to players. If you're walking along, you'll hear someone stepping up behind you. You want to turn around and shoot them before they can actually sneak up on you. So the, the audio challenge uh, here becomes a lot more relevant. And when we're talking about games with million dollar prize tags, you know, uh, people are going to pay attention. So if you're the sound guy that doesn't let that guy hear the footsteps coming up behind him or puts in an extra 10 milliseconds worth of lag, they're going to find you. You know, we're talking about 16 to 25 year olds that have just won a million dollars or lost a million dollars uh, who can afford lawyers. They're going to come get you. Uh, another interesting part about the first person games is because the engine is built to give you basically a, a view through someone's eyes is you can have uh, spectators basically playing in the game. So this is a character but without a character that you'd use as a virtual cameraman. So these 
virtual cameraman or phantom, phantom cameraman um, are quite a common part of these sports so that you can have someone moving around the map and showing you the most interesting point rather than a player's point of view, uh, which is generally hopping around so fast that it's impossible to follow even with someone shout casting the whole time and telling you exactly what you're seeing. In fact, some of the games uh, that have been running for a little longer, like uh, Counter-Strike, uh, have actually built a special version of their software for tournaments, and that will in, uh, actually encapsulate all of these uh, different options. So it has virtual cameraman, has a view of the map, you can jump into any player at any time, and you can do an entire broadcast without even having to use any bit of broadcast equipment. You can patch, package it up, make a screen, uh, stream, and send it out without having to, to even know what a video router is. So if we go back here and, and we look again at our, our picture, now we, we can see this is where the challenges are starting to, to become a bit more obvious. You know, team A and Team B now can't see what the other team's seeing. So the first thing we need to do is make sure that they can't actually see that screen. Uh, which is relatively easy. We can put the screen in front or beside the teams, uh, but now you're starting to interfere with the audience's interaction with the teams. Um, we also have to make sure that the audience can't yell out uh, to the teams on stage. You know, it's just, you, you'll hear it quite often. You know, it's like the world's biggest pantomime. You'll hear the fans of Team A scream out, Team B's behind you, um, and hoping that they'll be able to influence the game. The shoutcaster is also explaining everything blow by blow. So they will have information before the teams on stage will, because they're able to see all the screens plus uh, the individual view of each player. So we need to isolate them from that main audio system. Uh, and these, as I mentioned before, these events are loud. They're louder than any rock concert. You know, you're talking, you know, consistently 100 dB plus of people just screaming and cheering for their friends. So we have to make sure there's no lag. We have to make sure that there's no audio transmission between the audience, the speakers, and the teams, uh, and also between the teams themselves, whilst allowing the teams to interact with the audience and to communicate with their own team. The way this is being done now in the smaller studios is basically by putting the teams to soundproof boxes, which is not great. You know, you've got a little glass fish tank there, and you don't go to a live event to see five dudes in a fish tank playing computer games. Yeah, you want to see them on stage and interact. Um, there are a couple of other things that's come up more from the RTS side that I'll mention in a moment. Um, another thing that is, that is quite important here is that all the audio needs to be stereo. Uh, stereo. Uh, if it's not stereo, then you can't hear the spatialization of where the sound is coming from, and therefore you lose those audio cues. Uh, and now it's time for the big guns, real-time strategy, top-down games. Um, these were the first esports, and uh, they still exist as the most popular esports. Um, the games like the sports simulators will get the press you know, coverage. You know, the Formula One will push that they're doing an uh, esports um, side event to basically try and attract newer viewers. Uh, same with any other football league. But the RTS games are ground up diehard fans that have been doing this for 15 years or more. So the, the RTS or top-down, basically the, the defining factor, as you can see from the, the background here, is that you're looking down on the map from a super high angle, and usually you're controlling multiple units. So instead of first person, where it's one person, one character, we've now got one person controlling an army. Um, you also see that one of the other factors that's, um, that you'll see on the, the left, uh, sorry, on the right hand side over here is that there's a darkened part of the screen. You can only see as the commander what your units can see. Everything else is obscured by what's called the fog of war. Uh, different games have different rules about this, but in general you can, you can't see anything that's in the fog of war and everyone's fog of war is different. So even if you're on the same team, there might be some differences there. Um, some of these games, as I mentioned, being uh, like uh, League of Legends, which you see on the screen here, or StarCraft, have been running for, for 10 years. And because of that, you've got this kind of really deep culture of, of a fan base that knows what's going on, um, that can understand how people are moving, even when um, it looks like the game is moving fast. And so that interaction between the audience and the fans is much deeper, but it's also, uh, sorry, the audience and the teams is much deeper. But at the same time, it also means that there can be a lot more information gleaned if the players are able to hear the audience. So, 
back on our stage here, we now have to, we have the double challenge of an audience that is much deeply, much more deeply connected with their teams. So they want to see them live and in person, not behind a glass screen, and yet much more information that can actually be coming out of those, um, those audience interactions or the shoutcaster um, saying something that's going to be heard on stage. Uh, these are the guys who are leading the innovations, and I'll, I'll get back to those in a second when we get to that section shortly. The last uh, group is the Battle Royale, or the, the MOBA, the Massive uh, Online Battle Arenas. And this is where it's basically a first-person game, uh, but we have, instead of 10 people, we have up to 100 players playing simultaneously. Uh, and because these are the newer games, these are the ones that you find more on mobile. So the two that you've probably heard of, um, if you're following any esports, uh, is Fortnite uh, or PUBG. So PUBG came first, and then there was Fortnite. Uh, and both of them are uh, called Battle Royale because you start with 100 players, and the one who is standing at the end uh, is the winner. That's it. <laughs> so you've got a lot to follow. It's very hard to know. Um, which player is going to come out on top at the beginning. So it's not like you can say, oh, let's just focus on the favorite and two other people because they're moving at such a pace that things could change really quickly. Um, and these things are so popular now that they're actually influencing the design of uh, mobile phones. If you go and have a look for the Asus uh, Republic of Gamers or ROG phone, you'll find that it's designed so it can be held and powered and connected to a network um, in a competition environment. Uh, which you can imagine is quite important because if you have 100 people in a small space plus an audience trying to connect to Wi-Fi and guaranteeing that that Wi-Fi is going to be A, secure and B, without lag, you're going to have some issues. So a lot of these are done uh, by a wired connection, even though it's a phone. Um, the interesting thing, though, compared to, say, an RTS, even though they have a bigger audience, uh, is that they seem to be much more um, fad-based or seasonal. Uh, PUBG came out in 2017. By the end of 2017, they had 3 million people playing per day. Uh, then a year later, at the end of 2018, they were down to 1 million people playing per day, which is still a lot of people, uh, but it also shows that the interest is, is spikes very quickly and then drops off. So again, when it comes to longevity, we think that probably RTS is probably going to be the, the, the way to play. Now, this kind of looks similar. The only problem is, of course, if you have 100 players, you don't have Team A and Team B anymore. You have all the way down to Team Z. Usually, to make life easier, you don't allow individual play. You would allow team play. So you'd say four or five people to a team. But even then, you've got 20 to 25 teams that have to have their own individual communications, their own individual audio. Uh, all set up in such a way that you as the producer of the event, if you're doing the, the live or the broadcast stream, can have access to any of those views and actually make an interesting bit of content. Uh, there are quite a few stadia now that are being built, um, mostly in China and India, I haven't seen any anywhere else, uh, that are built just for mobile for, for these kind of events. Um, everything else, they're basically forcing the players onto PC. But that's like saying, okay, you're a football player, you're the top FIFA team, what we're going to do though is we're going to give you a, you know, an oval shaped American football uh, and you have to play the game with that. Yeah. You, they're not using the equipment that they train on basically. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the event, uh, the, the, this is what those, one of those events can look like. This is the 2019 Australian Open uh, in Melbourne. And yeah, there's 100 players there each with their own computer and you can tell that their computers are not mobiles because it was too difficult. Um, the screens are up high so that even if you tried to crane your neck and look around, you wouldn't see what was going on there. Um, but they were playing individually, so there's no team communications. Uh, and also they only followed about four or five individual players. Uh, the rest were basically um, open players who were not likely to have um, any chance of winning. So they made the production super easy here. No one really noticed that. Uh, it was an exhibition game, so it wasn't like a, a super high prize money game. But you can see that there's uh, already a lot of cabling going into an event like that. So the audio video challenges. As I mentioned during the thing, we need to mix the player intercom, the game audio, the judges and the coaches for each player. That's what they each player needs to hear. Um, the live audience needs to be able to see the screen and 
they will try and help their team. I mean, that's only natural. If you've been following a team for 10 years, you want to help them win. Then you have the announcer, you have the shoutcaster, who is yelling at everything at the top of his lungs. Um, and in some of the events that are multilingual, uh, for example, the riot games in China, you'll have four shoutcasters, two in English, two in Chinese, both out at full scale, <laughs> out the main PA. Um, very interesting to, to, to be a part of. Uh, you also have uh, sometimes a mix of um, real cameras there. So you have face cameras or team cameras to see, to show the audience what the team's actually doing or what their reactions are to the virtual footage that's coming from the servers uh, or the virtual cameraman. And if we're talking about streaming, um, there's a question there, I'll have to come back to the questions shortly. Uh, when it comes back to streaming, we also have to think about the positioning data of the audio, because if you're running one of those virtual cameramen, you need to have the audio as per that cameraman, not the audio as per the main audio mix. So let's have a uh, let's have a quick look at that. Let's try and diagram that out. I find that diagrams tend to help. So over here on the left, we have our player. And the first thing they want is their game audio. So they're going to have some in-ears for that. Uh, the next thing, they're going to have their comms, and they, they're going to want to talk to their teammate. Uh, you can do this through a lot of the game software. But in general, it's discouraged in a professional event. And the reason for that is that we don't want to have um, the team basically using that software to, to cheat or to have a secret conversation separate to the judges. So we'll have the judges uh, and the intercom basically on a separate system. So everything on the left-hand side of that red line there, the audio firewall, is what we want the player to hear. But then on the right, we have the audience who are going to launch here, and we have the shoutcasters who are telling the audience what to do. Uh, and then of course we have the main speakers, which not only have the shoutcasters and the game audio, uh, they could also have BGM, they could also have some other kind of event program audio that we want to have in there. Uh, I've shown the purple and the blue headset here deliberately, because what we're actually seeing is a lot of players, because that game audio is so critical, they'll have their own in-ear monitors basically, so little in-ear buds, and then on top of that, they'll stick uh, a headset. Um, You'll, we've tried a lot of things, and I've seen different people try different things um, to get around this here. Uh, for example, really big heavy headsets uh, or, or active noise cancellation, but let's, uh, let's look at why we can't use those. So the key here is trying to isolate audio that's on the other side of the audio firewall from getting to the player. Um, the main thing that's being used now is big heavy headsets that were designed for things like the Formula One uh, or for airports. So you're talking big sets of cans, big heavy isolation there, uh, and a boom mic. Um, the problem with those, though, is that the audio quality is so low that you don't get the fidelity that you need to actually hear the audio cues of the game of the game space around you. Um, also, Audio active noise cancellation doesn't really work. You know, it's designed to filter out low background noise like public transport or airplane engines. And in fact, a lot of ANC is actually tuned such that speech will go through, which bypasses our point, you know, of having people yelling out things from the audience. Uh, the other key thing here is that because the levels are so high, the ANC just starts to crap out. You know, we can't handle the, the 85 plus there. Uh, the way that they're doing it now is, as we saw in the, the image before, you'll have a set of in-ears, then you'll have a set of cans on top, and then what they're pumping in is white noise. You know, as you as you probably know, if you pump in background noise, uh, you'll actually desensitize the ears, so it's less easy for anyone to, to say anything to you. The big problem here, though, of course, is if someone is listening to white noise at high level for a long time, firstly, there's a, an OHS, a health and safety issue. Uh, and secondly, it's, an, it's quite annoying and you lose the sensitivity to your game audio. So again, we have that same problem there. Uh, and another thing that we're seeing is that the intercom systems are now actually becoming uh, an integrated part of the main audio mix. We have um, bigger though, big digital matrices that are running all the audio, mixing all the audio from the players and from the games, giving the players and games what they're supposed to hear and making sure that they don't hear what they're not, and then uh, basically doing stem mixing from that into the main front of house mixer. Jumping quickly onto the video challenges, uh, as I mentioned, lag is a, latency is a, is a big issue from, from all players. Um, Basically, it's discouraged to try and take anything from the players themselves. As I mentioned, a lot of the games now actually have software 
that will let you choose to watch a player rather than splitting off the video between their computer and their monitor. Uh, but even then, the judges, the shoutcasters, the front of house team who are making these mixes, the broadcasting team, need to be able to see all those video sources to make educated guesses on where to actually make those cuts. Uh, and when you think about that extra load on the game servers, you need to make sure that that's not actually then dragging down the server by having all this extra software that's running in the background. Similar to the virtual cameraman, they are the most critical because they have to run in the game itself. They can't run off splits or anything else because they're moving throughout the same game space. And they need to be in done in a way that doesn't increase the lag. Um, and of course, if the player can't see the full map, we don't want them to see you know, the big screen in any sense, in any way, shape or form. And that includes reflections uh, or LED. And um, LED, of course, brings in its own concerns with uh, RF there. So looking again here at the video setup, we have team A and team B, and we all have a face camera usually for each one of those um, team players. Now that's got to go out to the judges so that they can watch everyone and make sure that there's no cheating or no foul play. Uh, then you have to have those virtual cameras, you know, which uh, need to be able to move through the game space and also see what the other players are doing so that they can go and pick a nice shot. And then the shoutcasters need to see everything so that they can actually explain to the audience what's going on. And then all of that has to be combined and then put into the web stream. So it's starting to look a bit like a broadcast video router but at the same time, it has to be a live video router. And if any of you have ever made that divide from broadcaster AB or back again, you'll know that the video routers that work in one space are not really suited for the other. You know, for example, broadcast will use a lot of SDI, whereas an AV side will use more HDMI or DVI or some other display port or similar. Uh, there's not many companies that can actually handle that central video router in one bit of kit. Um, so what, what we're trying to do is find a way to have all these diverse systems controlled by one system that makes it easy for the operators to switch between these, but at the same time deal with all these different video sources uh, and demands on the um, on the equipment. And a cool thing there is that that actually breeds a lot of innovation. You know, by having uh, all these different requirements and different teams and people that have come up from different backgrounds, um, you see a lot of innovation that's going into these events. And one of them is uh, remote production. Um, so remote production has been a big topic in the broadcasting space uh, for a few years at least, you know, probably probably nearing a decade. Uh, and there's some companies that are doing it quite well. You know, one of the poster childs for remote production is NEP Broadcast. Uh, they have remote facilities in uh, two locations in Australia and a few in Europe. And the stadia basically just have cameramen and sound guys and then all the mixing all the video switching graphics and such is done uh, at a centralized location so instead of having to move all the technical equipment out from your garage basically and then to an event meaning that the capital equipment is stuck in a truck whilst you're moving it around uh, you centralize all of that uh, the IP technologies are there, and that's a whole other session, <laughs> and I'm happy to do one if required, about the technologies that you can use to go long distances with low latency um, that allows you to centralize the equipment and the personnel. Uh, a great example of this is if you, uh, for example, your sound engineer who is in Sydney is sick, calls in sick, but the only other guy is in Melbourne, he can go to the Melbourne studio and you just reroute the facility, uh, the audio streams there and they can mix from that console there, uh, even though they're a thousand kilometers away. So we end up with lower capital costs, better utilization. We have lower travel costs because the, the expensive crew uh, don't have to fly around the world. And then also you have better use of technicians. Uh, if any of you have worked in large countries like the US or worked around Europe or Australia, um, you know that a good portion of your time is used up in travel, just getting from one event to the next. And if you could switch from one event to the next by just going home and then coming back to the office in the morning, you'd actually have a lot more events and you'd have a lot more time doing what you want to do. You'd have a lot more time mixing audio or cutting vision or editing rather than sitting on a plane, which I guess right now in the current environment seems like a dream too far, but um, yeah, you know what I mean. There's also on the game side, um, some advances in areas like Google Arena. And whilst Google Arena is not at a point where it can be using eSports, the concept is that you'd use Google servers to run the game, which are much more powerful than what you'd have on site. And then you'd have low powered computers 
at the venue that would be running uh, the audio and uh, basically the, the audio and video only from there. And so the gamers would be able to use those. So that's kind of like remote production, but for gaming. And if it gets to the point where they can actually can get over the latency issues that they're having now, that could become remote production for games, meaning that anyone could do an esports event uh, or you could distribute it uh, across anyone's house, basically. So any general internet connection. Um, and it's it's not fantasy. This um, was actually happened last year in what's called the mid-season invitationals um, from from League of Legends, uh, LOL. There, uh, it was half planned. So they originally didn't want to send all their crew to Vietnam. Uh, they wanted to send basically an advanced team, do stem mixing, basically then send stuff back to LA. Uh, but there was a bit of, bit of a logistics screw up. Um, half the team couldn't get into Vietnam, they couldn't get visas, and a lot of the equipment was stuck in customs. So they were forced to basically do a full remote production uh, of League of Legends. So the only things that were on site were basically the, um, the, game, the game machines, the game server, uh, and then the local um, projection screens. Everything else was remote controlled from, uh, from LA. Um, yeah, so that's a, it's a real thing that's happening, and it's quite interesting to see that they got that spun up in the space of about you know, two or three weeks, rather than the month that it usually takes to plan something like the Olympics. Okay, so that was a really quick, really rushed uh, introduction to esports uh, across everything there and the challenges that we face in the audio and the vision side. Um, like all sports, you know, it's all about fairness. We want to make sure that the game is played by top level athletes um, that are at the peak of their game that aren't being distracted or influenced by something else. Uh, because essentially that's what any of us go to watch any sport for. You know, you're either interested in soccer or baseball and you want to see how the top of the world play. That's exactly what people who watch esports are doing. They're interested in seeing how they can improve their own game by watching the pros or really just watching how much better the pros are than themselves. Um, but as soon as that legitimacy, legitimacy is threatened, like a doping scandal or a cheating scandal, everyone falls apart. So that's, that's why it's such a, a key point to those leagues, to the, the games and the publishers that are making the games. Um, so there's a lot of detail put into the AV world. Um, coming from a, an intercom background, it used to be that intercom was the last thing that anyone would think of at any event. Um, but it feels great to be involved in a, in a space where it's actually first and foremost in everyone's mind. Uh, and anyone here is scratching their head about an event where you think, well, why didn't the production manager think about calling the audio guy or think about calling the lighting guy or the video guy? Uh, at least in esports, they call you first, and that's a good place to be. So. I have much more on my LinkedIn. I feel free to email me if you've got more questions. Um, but I did see a couple of questions come through, and I think we've got a bit of time to take some of those now. We do. I had a couple come in. Um, the first one, is there a trend of designing eSports sound systems to be capable of accurately positioning audio objects outputted from the game in Dolby Atmos or um, Aura 3D? Yeah, so most of the games these days are actually built with 3D audio in mind. So they're using HRTF, which is the main um, algorithm formula uh, to position that data. Uh, the only problem with things like Dolby Atmos uh, or even HRTF is it's made at the source. Um, so whilst the game systems uh, are capable of creating this, you can't have, say, a different source for everyone who's watching it. Um, so for everyone who's watching the game, uh, you'll have a different point of view. And of course, if they have a different point of view, uh, it then makes it hard to then generate thousands and thousands of Atmos streams. If we're talking about the live uh, audio in the actual uh, hall, like in the arena, then absolutely yes. Uh, there's, depending on the size, at the super top end, um, couldn't be possible really, because you've got, a, say, the bird's nest is around arena. You couldn't get everyone with positional data, uh, but the smaller arena where we're talking about 300 to 1,000 people uh, definitely have surround systems installed and will take that, uh, that feed. Okay, the next question. Do we see a future where a front of house engineer would mix directly from stems and metadata from Unreal or Unity Engine's audio middleware? Oh, now that, I don't think we're seeing that yet because you'd have to actually use the engine. Um, like you'd have to use Unity or a similar engine to actually do that. Uh, but I don't think it's far off. 
Um, I think the only limitation now is just because we don't have equipment that can do that. Like there's no, um, <laughs> there's no positional data input um, to a console these days. But we are starting to see more people use um, IP um, audio for these things. So coming straight out Dante uh, or using Dante or AES67 to connect all your devices. Uh, so the, I'd say the infrastructure is there. The only thing missing really is the ability for say a, a mixer to do auto mixing based off that. So I think all the blocks are there and this is the cool thing about eSports is a lot of the blocks exist and it now just takes people to plug it together in that way to do that. And uh, whoever asked that question, email me because there's probably people I can put you in contact with who might, uh, might be able to help with that. Okay, the next question, are multiple audio mixers submixed used to handle the player comms or are bigger leagues using systems like RTS and RIDL to handle player game comms? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, as you heard in the intro, I was working with RIDL for some years. Um, but yeah, it's, you do see those big audio matrices, uh, sort of intercom matrices um, being involved. So your, your atoms from RTS, uh, which to be honest, are a bit less used because um, the actual latency through an atom system is, is greater than through other systems. Uh, so you mostly see the Eclipse HX from Clearcom and the Arda system from Readle being used. And as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, you basically do some, some uh, sorry, stem mixing from that. So the player comms and player audio are all mixed in the intercom system. Uh, and then you take stems from that out that go to the audio mixer for front of house of the broadcast. All right, the next question, how important is it in your opinion that the live audience hears the event like a rock concert rather than have the live audience hear it like the players experience using arrays versus near field distributed point sources? Yeah, it's, I think you'd have to go for the rock concert thing because there's, there's a significant, um, and I mentioned the virtual cameraman because I think this is close to the same point. Um, it's like when you're driving a car, it's very easy to get motion sickness if you're watching someone and hearing someone, but you're not in control. If you're a gamer and you know you're going to turn left, you're expecting the whole world to turn left on you. But if you're an audience member and suddenly the whole room shifts, you know, if you're talking about a dark room and the only thing you can see is the screen, um, it can be very disorientating. Um, even, you know, uh, what, 15 years ago when we were demoing some of this stuff um, in some theatres, we'd have people leave the theatre whilst they're watching these games because we did the full surround sound and when you turned they weren't expecting that much. So I think thinking of it more as a rock concert, maybe with some surround elements, uh, but using a virtual cameraman to control that view and make it a bit more stable and kind of predictable to the, to the viewing audience uh, is definitely important. All right, the next question, is individual audio from each player's PC sent to the broadcast mix or is one specific audio source used? If all sources are used, do you have to use audio follow videos to keep up with the audio source that has been punched by the TV? Yeah, yeah, definitely it's the audio follow video is, is a key part of this. Um, uh, you'll only really see that on the bigger events uh, or if you're using um, basically a fully software solution, something like a vMix, uh, which is an audio video router based in a computer. Uh, AFV is not something that you see in many consoles um, in like the live event area. Uh, so usually in those events where it's a smaller, cheaper system, you'll just have the virtual cameraman and one audio source from that cameraman. Uh, in the bigger events, League of Legends, uh, especially, uh, I imagine so with Overwatch and those other big games, yeah, you definitely have a, a audio console that's a broadcast grade audio console with AFV. And so as the video mixer is choosing who they're gonna watch, the audio would then automatically switch. It's too fast for, a, for an audio guy to follow. Okay, we have another question. You said players often wear earbuds and cams, but which sources go to each? Gaming comms to earbuds and white noise to cams? Uh, typically, uh, the earbuds are only the game audio and then comms and everything else go to the cans. Uh, the reason the comms go to the cans is because if you are let, allowing comms to go through the computer side rather than an intercom system, it does actually open up for cheating. For example, if you have someone who's being killed in a game and is now waiting for the next thing, they could easily turn around and look at the screen behind them or you know, maybe pop their ear off and actually talk there. And the judge wouldn't hear that if it was going through the computer. So intercom is generally set separately. 
Okay, we have another one. Um, how much are you trying to decrease the overall system SPL and room reflections washing the stage versus with a rate prediction and acoustic treatment? Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, a lot of these um, arena are basically done by people who don't have any of these considerations in mind. So they just jam a whole bunch of speakers wherever they can uh, into a small room that wasn't built for this. Uh, and in the original let's call them mid-size arena that you'd see in places like Shanghai, uh, it, was, it was impossible. So the only way to really control it was to basically stick a bunch of um, noise isolation cans on the, on the players. Uh, now though, you're starting to see people really design um, the, the space and the system such that you're avoiding um, splashback on the stage. I mean, if you think about it, we've been dealing with, uh, you know, keeping front of house audio off the stage for years. That's what line arrays were for rather than point sources and why we have cardioid subs now rather than, than front, you know, uh, omni subs. Uh, but the spaces themselves are now also being used to try and keep that sound away from the players. So having the screens working as kind of reflectors to, to bunch some of that sound out towards the audience. Okay, the next question is, what are the most common audio consoles used for eSports? I mean, there is a huge range. Um, if we if we cut away this kind of lower end of people who are just using what they can get their hands on, uh, in the sort of mid to large size, you are seeing a lot of the the broadcast grade consoles. So you're seeing the Lavos, you're seeing Stagecraft. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, mine's gone blank from there. Stage Tech is the word I was looking for. Um, you're seeing a few Calrex and such. Um, but those are kind of the main ones. You're not seeing so much of like a, you know, a Yamaha or a Soundcraft um, front of house mixer unless they're receiving stems. So the other way you'll see it is you'll see, like I mentioned before, the intercom system or a bigger matrix system running a matrix, mixing stems, and then your front of house person might be using, uh, say, a Yamaha or a Soundcraft with a Dante input, and they're just mixing, uh, say, co uh, player comms, game audio, and, uh, and Soundcasters only. Okay, um, that's all that came in on my end. So I think we're just about at time. Um, Cameron, thank you so much for that presentation. That was wonderful. And thank you everyone for attending. Um, just a reminder, this is recorded, so we'll send this out in a few days. And we hope that you'll join us on our upcoming webinars. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Kylie. Stay safe.